Welcome to the Futurati Podcast. Any member of the Futurati is somebody who believes in the power of the future. We know there's a better world ahead, and we indeed have the power to make it so. In our podcast, we talk to the best minds in the world about the most urgent problems facing mankind today, and we hope you learn as much from them as we do. I'm Thomas Fry, a professional futurist and keynote speaker. And I'm Trent Fowler, a machine learning engineer and author. Thank you for joining us. And tonight we have uh, Trent Fowler and, and David Joke with us as we're going to dive into the topic of artificial intelligence. Absolutely. Thanks, Thomas. So Dave Joke is an author, artificial intelligence theorist, and former serial entrepreneur. In 2006, he founded eCortex Incorporated, a research company affiliated with the University of Colorado Boulder, and that company performs neural network and brain architecture simulation research for the U.S. government defense and intelligence agencies. He has published several theory papers on safety aspects of artificial general intelligence, and previously Dave founded and operated a number of venture-funded information technology startup firms. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Computer Science and Engineering from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Dave, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Trent. Glad to be here. So I thought we would start off by contextualizing what the discussion is going to be. So we are going to be talking about artificial general intelligence, and I was hoping that you could demystify some of those terms for us. How do you think about intelligence, and how do you think specifically about artificial general intelligence? Yeah, so the, the history of the field is now coming up on um, uh, more than 70 years old. And um, early on, uh, it was just artificial intelligence. And um, people had a variety of notions as to how we might use computers to uh, create or emulate uh, human intelligence. Um, because it seems, at least at first glance, that there are a lot of similarities between um, human intelligence, what we understand or experience as intelligence, and what computers can do, since they can add and, and uh, organize information and print out text and, and such, uh, it seems as though uh, we might be able to do that. And uh, over the course of the first, let's call it um, a decade and a half, um, a lot of research took place to attempt to do this, and, and uh, there were some initial successes and a lot of, a lot of failures. Um, from the perspective of trying to create human intelligence. However, um, many or most of those uh, failures in that regard ended up being successes from a different perspective, meaning that uh, they created tools and algorithms and basically software that did useful things, um, just as uh, accounting software was one of the biggest early applications of computers. Some of the early AI algorithms uh, uh, created valuable uh, valuable products as well. Um, so, uh, but, but there was a realization that this did not create the kind of intelligence that humans had, it just performed tasks. So, at that time, there, there was a split, and uh, the terminology is fraught. In other words, there have been a lot of controversies about what different things should be called. Um, I call the split artificial intelligence versus artificial general intelligence, with uh, AGI being artificial general intelligence and the general being intended to refer to the kind of intelligence that humans have, or at least the kinds of capabilities that humans have to apply their intelligence very broadly. Um, and so those are the main distinctions I make and, uh, and that many people make. Um, and uh, th those, those distinctions last to this day. Um, we see uh, various types of AI technology being used to perform analysis of data for marketing purposes and that sort of thing, including, including very recent technologies like deep learning. And um, those, those are just narrow tools that are related to AI in that they're derived from the field but um, they, have, they make no pretense of creating general intelligence. Does that make sense to you, Trent? Yeah, it absolutely does. So it sounds like you tend to favor a functional definition of intelligence. So we, we know we have a human level artificial general intelligence when it's competing with us across a wide variety of domains. Is that fair? 
Sort of. I try to shy away from the argument as to what intelligence should mean, um, because it becomes it becomes a fairly religious argument. Uh, uh, people people think it should mean what they want it to mean for their purposes. So, um, uh, and and there's not consistency there. Um, uh, you know, one of the one of the sayings of the field is that uh, we sh- um, just like we created airplanes to fly, we didn't have to copy the way that birds did it. Um, intelligence can be created any number of ways. Um, uh, I think I think that that suggests a particular definition of intelligence. I'm not. I don't. I don't really want to argue about what the word intelligence should mean, but rather that there ought to be a distinction between these two sorts of approaches to uh, creating um, uh, creating intelligence or um, uh, uh, human-like cognitive capabilities on a computer. Um, by the way, uh, it it should be mentioned that even the distinction I'm making is very controversial among some people. Uh, there, are, there are those who believe that if we just assemble a large enough set of narrow artificial intelligence capabilities, that that's all we need to create general intelligence. And um, uh, I'm not going to argue specifically against that here. It's not not a, not something that I favor as a theory. Um, uh, it seems to me that it begs the question, the hard question. But uh, but of course, it's impossible to prove that any of these approaches can't work. Right. You do have this sort of fascinating dynamic in the field where they're thinking that if you just have millions of little special purpose modules and you glue them together in the right right way, intelligence will sort of fall out of it. And then there's the opposite camp that believes you have to have a general mechanism of intelligence that somehow integrates these inputs and outputs and bases decisions on that. That's right. And, um, uh, of course, they're, they're, those folks recognize that in that case there would need to be some sort of special purpose thing to tie it all together. Um, but they see no obstacle to that. I do. But th- uh, th- there are those who do not. Okay. So setting that aside for a moment, given that artificial general intelligence seems to be some time away and we failed so far to develop it, why are we worried about its safety? Well, um, you know, people vary in how much they're actually worried about the safety of it. And uh, the distinction between general and narrow artificial intelligence comes into play here. Again, because uh, we are in fact building systems that incorporate narrow AI uh, into things that are now interacting with the world. So previously, most of our computer systems, uh, you know, they, they sit in a computer and they do their thing and they might, uh, at, at worst, they might kind of mess up your network or something, but uh, they're not out in the physical world. Now we're looking at autonomous vehicles and robots and other types of things that um, could actually create uh, immediate effects in the world. Um, and so uh, people are concerned about that sort of safety. I'm not particularly expert in that sort of safety because uh, it really isn't any different than any other technology safety the issue. Um, It's more complex than a lot of things, um, but but the kinds of things that come up with, again, uh, autonomous vehicles um, are just the same as they they come come up with a cruise control. Uh, They're just a little bit more sophisticated. And so um, I don't don't focus on that kind of issue. Rather, I focus on a a bit longer term issue, Um, the safety of artificial general intelligence, meaning that if and when we create uh, uh, some sort of uh, computing system uh, that uh, is as capable as a human, there are all sorts of interesting implications to that. Um, that and, the, and the issues are very, very different than they are for making sure autonomous vehicles don't hit pedestrians and such. Um, so, uh, you know, I mean, that would be the next place we would go in this conversation, I guess, is that, uh, that question. So, David, um, with it, it always strikes me that we run into more danger with artificial intelligence by putting it in the hands of devious people, rather than uh, uh, I think the the, art, the danger of artificial general intelligence is more long range, and the devious people problem is more near term. Um, so, when you turbocharge somebody. Oh, uh, 
sabotaging things and and holding people at ransom, uh, it seems like you could do uh, ten times the damage on the, or a thousand times the damage with artificial intelligence as you could with um, somebody on their own. Uh, is is that correct? I, I I think that's right. I mean, uh, you know, any any technology, any software. And when I say technology, I mean any kind of technology, bio, biotechnology, uh, computing technology, even even mechanisms. Uh, you know, we can do a lot more damage with a gun than we can with a knife. Um, we can do a lot more damage with the kind of knowledge we have about uh, um, biology than we could when we just, uh, you know, could throw mud at people. And so, um, and so technology is always a leverage point uh, for those who want to do harm or, or, or ill. Um, and you know, AI from that perspective, again, is just another technology. It's a technology that can be used to leverage someone's desires to do good or, or bad. And so, um, and so, yes, these are, these are distinctly concerns. And again, I, I would say that I don't have a, a particular, you know, obviously I've, I've thought about it some and, and uh, paid attention to it, but I don't have a particularly, uh, uh, unusual expertise in these kinds of technology safety issues in general or with respect to AI because again they're you know quality assurance uh, security um, all the kinds of things you'd always want to put into a software system um, you know uh, models like NASA and the nuclear power industry would good, be good places to look as to how to make those sorts of things safe um, uh, because those those folks know how to make those kinds of equipment safe Okay, so it seems like on the one hand you're saying that we've got these narrow artificial intelligences such as self-driving cars that are beginning to come online. There are certainly ethical considerations that have to be weighed in those scenarios. And, but you alluded to some particular safety issues which arise when you're dealing with a general intelligence. Could you say a little bit more about that? Well, I'd like to say a lot more about it because that's really that's really the thing that uh, I think I can um, I can add a unique spin on. Um, the uh, the issue is this: if we create uh, artificial intelligence that is capable of um, all of the cognitive uh, things that humans can do, then it can do things like invent new technologies, and uh, in, importantly, it can improve itself. Um, meaning that, for example, uh, j just as one simple example, let us say that I was able to create a, uh, an artificial intelligence that ran on the, on the latest Intel processor with a certain amount of RAM. Um, uh, the AGI would be capable of creating the next generation of that Intel processor, improving its own code, all that sort of thing, and then rebooting and running again. And now it's, uh, uh, or uh, you know, installing itself on that new processor. And now it's faster than it was. Um, that that's a sort of a recursive self improvement. Um, and this is the issue that, uh, that arises in general intelligence that does not arise in narrow artificial intelligence. In other words, AlphaGo, Google, uh, uh, DeepMinds, uh, I, I forget now whether that's DeepMind or Google, but AlphaGo came out of Google or a subsidiary. Um, and um, the same basic architecture can be used to defeat uh, the world's chess champions as well as the world's Go champions. Right, so this is a very powerful thing, and it has some generality in it, doesn't it? Because it isn't just the same game. And yet, uh, it couldn't begin to throw a baseball or uh, do any of the things that we do to interact with the world. It couldn't begin to persuade you, Trent, that you ought to uh, you know, go work out this afternoon. Um, and uh, so these, these sorts of things um, are not general intelligence yet, and th th those sorts of self, self, uh, recursive self-improvement do not arise as, as, as one of the risks. With general intelligence, they do arise, and ultimately they become the most important, the most important issue and risk. 
Yeah, so it strikes me that this issue of recursive self-improvement is kind of at the heart of the whole conversation, and I, I wonder if we could drill down a little bit and discuss that. So I know that we don't have very many examples of recursively self-improving systems. I mean, arguably, you could point to Douglas Linnaeus Eurisco system. Uh, Jürgen schmidt huber has got the Girdle machine, which is just a, a theoretical prototype, not, not anything that's actually been built. So do you have any thoughts as to whether or not the process of recursive self-improvement could continue in an unbounded fashion, or might it be the case that there are these these roadblocks to becoming radically greater than human intelligence in a short time span? I love this question because, um, first of all, um, obviously theoretically we can sort of envision the idea that there's no bound on the recursive self-improvement. Um, so uh, that's sort of interest, an interesting study all on its own, right? What happens? And this is where these ideas of a singularity come about, right? Uh, where you have this um, sort of exponential improvement happening that has no real upper bound, um, uh, and and therefore you have this uh, you know this this kind of uh, zone beyond which you can't see anything. Um, that's interesting, but it's not necessary to create pretty much all of the concerns we have. I think that um, I think that if we simply are able to create human level AI on systems that we have today. That, that system will be able to improve itself in a way that we humans cannot. Now, humans are a good example of recursive self-improvement. We've, you know, we, um, uh, although it's slow and human nature itself doesn't change that much, um, we have been able to create technologies, for example, that allow us to live longer on average, right? So uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, the average lifespan was in the, I think, in the mid 40s, um, and now it's in the uh, low 80s uh, in most places. Um, and so uh, we've been able to uh, recursively self-improve in a sense. Um, AGI won't have those same sorts of the same sorts of limitations we do because it's a um, it's a computational infrastructure. Um, again, if if we're able to create it, and there's lots of interesting questions there, but I'm, I'm, all of this assumes that we create it. Um, uh, now it's on a computational infrastructure that we we know the basic structure of how to improve that, um, and it will improve along with it. And so um, uh, it doesn't even need to change the architecture of its original creation. It would just have to improve the computational infrastructure, the hardware, as it were, <clears throat> to be able to um, to be able to recursively self-improve. So, so David, we hear we hear a lot of people talking about uh, a future based on quantum computing and how quantum computing is going to mm, kind of uh, turbocharge the the world in lots of interesting ways uh, can you talk a little bit about the intersection of artificial intelligence and quantum computing um yeah i think it's null okay <laughs> in other words I think, in other words i don't really see that quantum computing has any particular relevance to artificial intelligence the issues that we're um uh, that are faced in artificial intelligence and again artificial general intelligence um, uh, I don't really suspect have anything to do with the kinds of advantages that quantum computing give us. In other words, we, what we need to discover and learn and figure out is how um, the brain thinks and how the kinds of cognitive capabilities we have in, in, the, uh, in humans arise uh, from a uh, from a computa from a computational or computational emulation perspective, quantum computing tends to uh, emphasize relatively narrow questions. It can solve um, kind of combinatorial problems extremely fast. If, when I say it can, if we're, able, we're ever able to successfully create a quantum computer, um, uh, that's the kind of thing that it solves. And combinatorics is, is, is something that's solved by the brain or by uh, parallel processing, not by um, uh, in a different kind of parallel processing than we find in quantum computing. It's not it's not an optimization problem. It's, it's a um, it's a kind of uh, dynamic settling sort of approach. So. We can get into a lot of detail about this, but I, I really don't see that the overlap is, um, is uh, it, it doesn't seem to me to have any overlap at all, really. Um, you know, if someday we have quantum computers that can do all the things that regular computers can do, but faster, well, then fine. 
Um, but that would be the only thing I can think of. Now, there is one one connection that uh, people make. Um, Roger Penrose uh, had a theory that um, uh, consciousness has a quantum origin. When I say quantum origin, of course, all chemistry has a quantum origin, but he, he meant it more directly. The consciousness arises from a quantum uh, process that's going on inside the microtubules in your um, uh, in your neurons. Um, and uh, without getting into it, uh, very, very few people think that has any sense to it. So to, to your point about the computational structure of the brain, do you think that a more promising approach to artificial general intelligence lies in rethinking the whole approach and starting over from the fundamentals or trying to mimic what's happening in the brain via an upload or a neuromorphic chip or some other um, similar approach? So uh, first of all, just to, just to be careful here, and, and I've, I've become more conscious recently of the importance of being careful about this point. Um, the uh, saying the computational structure of the brain, and I'm not criticizing you because I've used that phrase myself many times, um, is, is dangerous because probably the brain is more like an analog computer than a digital computer. And the kinds of things we need to do to produce cognition using a digital computer are more along the lines of emulation of an analog computer than they are um, of, of kind of mapping some sort of uh, algorithmic computational process to the uh, to the to what's going on in the mind. Um, and there are a lot of really important reasons for that. And there's a lot of evidence that um, uh, attempting to create kind of determinate um, uh, data structures that represent knowledge simply does not work. Um, and so, um, so in a way, I think that we're already doing that. In other words, the, the history of artificial intelligence for, let's call it 50 years, was very much along the lines of creating the right, trying to create the right boxes and arrows that organize knowledge and organize intelligence. Um, there was a system called Psych, CYC, um, that's uh, well known in the AI community that is a, is a fabulous uh, uh, testament to uh, uh, human persistence they've attempted to c capture all of human knowledge or all common sense human knowledge in a data structure um, that's searchable and it's actually people use it for various things and it's actually pretty useful to have all that data there um, but it doesn't create intelligence nor does it cre create knowledge and there are reasons there are very deep and important reasons why that's the case so as a result we do have to kind of go back Back to the um, back to ground zero, um, back to the starting point, and think about what the brain looks like. Now, I would not claim that that's the only way to create artificial general intelligence. I just don't. I, I just don't see that um, uh, the other approaches show much promise toward it, and uh, and so I think that is the best and fastest way. Most importantly, I think it's the fastest way. We have we have an existing uh, proof proof of uh, 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 concept proof in the human brain. We know that this thing we call general intelligence exists, and we know a decent amount about it. Why don't we try to approach it that way? Um, that would be my thinking. And so. This is what people have been doing. Now, neural network research began pretty early, actually, in the 60s. Um, it was very, it, it, had, a, it had a brief um, um, uh, period where it was popular in the, in the early 80s until um, a series of events caused that research to die out for a while. Um, it is now, um, when people talk about AI now, they actually are typically talking about neural network style AI. Uh, even though there are plenty of other systems like Watson and such that don't use uh, neural networks. But uh, the success of uh, AlphaGo in beating the greatest Go masters in the world, um, that's all deep learning, deep network stuff. Um, uh, and it's all, uh, at least at some level, a kind, a kind of emulation of some of the things that are going on in the brain is a small subset. Uh, it leaves out a lot of stuff. On the other hand, it solves some problems that for a long time seemed intractable. Um, specifically, uh, uh, you know, there's a thing called Moravec's paradox that uh, I forget exactly when that was first coined as a term, but the, the paradox was that uh, 
the things that humans can do that animals can't, meaning logic and, and uh, abstract thinking and abstract, abstract kind of combinations and math, all those hard things that animals can't do, that turned out to be pretty easy to build into computers. And all the things that all the animals can do just as well as we can, in some cases, in many cases, a lot better, like perception, um, it turned out to be very hard and, in fact, at least during those, that stage of AI, impossible. Um, well, we've actually figured out enough about that that we seem to be able to do a significant bit of perception, um, meaning uh, um, deep networks can recognize visual objects, they can do auditory processing um, at, a lev- at a level that uh, rivals humans uh, in some cases. Now again, it's completely acontextual. It doesn't do all the things human do, humans do, but compare, comparing humans looking at a picture of a thing and uh, a deep learning system that's properly trained looking at that same picture, um, they do very well. And you know, the best evidence for this is that in radiology, which is a, a very hard thing to learn, you have to humans learn it by um, rote repetition and, and error-driven training. Um, the a- AI systems are getting to be almost as good as the humans. So, David, a lot of what humans learn and what human knowledge is about is about doing things, about uh, touching things and feeling things. You, you can't learn how to lay bricks unless you actually put bricks in place. And, and so the, the human experience doesn't translate well into artificial intelligence. Um, a computer, computers don't have an understanding of what the, the concept of hot is or cold is. And, um, I mean, they understand the parameters and everything, but unless you um, uh, kind of experience it yourself, it, it's, it's so, a little hard to, to describe it. So what are, um, is it possible for these kind of concepts to be reverse engineered from the human mind into artificial intelligence? Um, I, I don't think so because I think that it's necessary also to have a body. And um, I, I think at this point it would actually be good to reference a, uh, a, a, num- a few thinkers that have um, uh, emphasized this. Um, I actually finally got around to reading a book called What Computers Still Can't Do and by Hubert Dreyfus, who was a philosopher at Berkeley, um, uh, and uh, but he was an expert in, um, in the philosophies of Martin Heidegger and uh, uh, Merleau-Ponty. And uh, Pont- Merleau-Ponty was actually one of the first to kind of promote this notion that um, it's embodiment that makes all the difference in the human experience. And um, when you start to think about it, if uh, it, it doesn't take very long to realize that that um, kind of most of our experience is through our body. Like, yeah, we can shut our eyes and try to drown out all the sounds and think, but um, it's actually, that's an unusual state of affairs, not a typical state of affairs. Um, and sure, we might be walking down the street and get lost in our thoughts and then trip over the sidewalk. But again, that's not that's not the typical experience. The typical experience is I go into the kitchen and I uh, chop some vegetables and throw it in a pot to make some dinner. And um, uh, you know, I walk out, I walk out the door by moving my legs and opening the doorknob and and uh, stepping outside and going for a run or or whatever it is. All, all these things are bodily experiences. And so um, the idea that the idea that we could somehow abstract those um, without uh, that that a a machine system could somehow abstract those or that we could represent them simply without uh, having it have a body or or, um, seems implausible now here's an interesting question though um, and I don't don't really know the answer to this Um, what if we have a first AI that we give it a body and it learns all these things and then we copy it into another system and that one doesn't have a body well, now I think that might work. Um, you know, uh, obviously, people who people who uh, later in life um, uh, get disabilities, they're injured, they, they lose a, lose a limb, or they lose all of their limbs. Those people still have their entire conceptual structure. They may they, they remember what it was like to have those limbs. They they know what it's like. They know what spatial experience is like. So um, it seems like that that could work. 
And so once you've created one that has had that experience and built it, because unlike humans, where we can't really copy our brains, at least if the idea of emulating a brain can work, we can copy the uh, the uh, whatever whatever digital information is there to store that emulator, if that makes sense to you. Yeah, it absolutely does. And and there's really a lot of uh, philosophy and computer science that, that we could explore here. But I, I did want to ask you, what are some of the major approaches to AGI safety, and what do you think are the major drawbacks to those approaches? Well, I think that. The field has gone in a direction that um, emphasizes um, non-neuromorphic approaches. And you use the term neuromorphic, and for the audience, let's just clarify that that means that it uses things like neural networks. It tries to emulate the neural systems in the brain at some level. And, and there, there are many different levels of abstraction which these systems do that. And, uh, nobody knows the answer of what the right level of abstraction is. Obviously, less detail makes it easier to build. More detail makes it more true to the way the brain does it. Um, and so um, uh, we don't know. But um, most of the approaches to AI safety today, uh, to me, very disappointingly, emphasize um, non-neuromorphic approaches, which in my view, are not that likely to achieve success for exactly the same kinds of reasons I said earlier. Um, and uh, you know, they're not typically embodied. They don't. They don't emphasize a perceptual experience and context. They uh, uh, Dreyfus would call it a an implementation of rationalism, uh, which is uh, uh, perhaps too heavy philosophical for this uh, for this uh, discussion. But. Um, there are really it's not just a it's not just a complaint there are really good reasons why uh, GoFi G-O-F-A-I which stands for good old fashioned AI um, doesn't work to create general intelligence so I can't prove that it won't ever work but um, it, it, it has had a lot of first steps that, that didn't get very far um, whereas uh, deep learning and neural networks have shown that they've made continuous and regular progress uh, so far. And if you look at some of the things that DeepMind is doing, uh, their papers are just fascinating. Um, they are continually dragging in more elements about what we know in neuroscience into their models and their systems. And they continue to do interesting things. And so, um, so I think that, that, first of all, the problem with most of the approaches to general AI safety is that they emphasize these very discrete um, uh, knowledge representations, and they attempt to essentially prove that the AI is safe. Now, um, with a uh, with an autonomous driving car, I can sort of imagine that you might be able to do something useful with that. Um, with AGI, um, the knowledge structures are not explicit, sufficiently explicit to prove anything about it. You might be able to get some statistical results, um, but we're not going to be able to prove it. So therefore, they, they end up trying to solve the problem with protections of various sorts, like um, uh, put, trying to keep the AI in a box. They refer to it as the control problem. Uh, in other words, we'd like to control the AIs. Now, um, let's suppose that you were um, you lived on an island um, and, and uh, you were isolated and you heard that some people were coming and they were a little worried about how you'd behave toward them and they spent a lot of time talking about the control problem. <laughs> would, you, would you welcome them onto your island and trust them? <laughs> or would you, uh, would you treat them as the greatest threat to you? And this is, this is, I think, one of the worst aspects of the way AI safety is currently approached is we're creating all this documentation for the AIs that we're not to be trusted. Um, and so, um, and so, I think that uh, that is both futile because it can't. Uh, and there, are, there's lots of evidence. Um, Nick Bostrom has a has a good book that kind of goes through all the. It's called Super Intelligence. Um, there's a subtitle, um, and it goes through kind of all the arguments why really we can't control it, and yet it still talks about trying to. Um, and um, um, there are a number of researchers now. Roman Yampolsky is an, among them who don't have any pretense that we can actually control any of this stuff. Um, Roman's conclusion that we shouldn't create it um, 
uh, others have different views. I have a, I have a somewhat different view, but um, uh, so so that's some of, sort of a survey of kind of how people are thinking about AI safety. Okay, so what's your favorite approach for this? And since, since you don't like what's on offer, what what do you think should be the way that we conceptualize building artificial general intelligences with eth ethical architectures that are conciliant with what we want? Yeah, so um, that, it, it does ra that, that raises a different issue, which we might want to discuss after I answer the first question, which is uh, who determines what it is that we want, <laughs> um, or how do we determine that? Um, the uh, you know the current um, the, the current uh, situation with the uh, uh, COVID nineteen uh, brings up those kinds of things because it becomes very clear that different people want different things, and they're very different, not just a little different. Um, so, uh, but um, assuming that we can agree on something, uh, and I do have a proposal for that, but assuming that we can agree on something, my approach does depend on some aspects of the way that I think AGI is most likely to be created. Specifically, um, I think that it's likely to be an embodied system. Uh, it's likely to need to develop its entire conceptual structure through learning. In other words, there are no a priori or implanted concepts in this thing. Um, uh, its motivations are, 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 are built at a low level, meaning that um, there's, there's something that creates a, a sense of pain or pleasure within it that drives its decisions towards, towards uh, satisfying its needs, which is how it builds its purpose. Um, so those are all aspects of how I think it needs to be built to actually work. Given all that, the uh, my approach to safety largely involves bringing it upright. <laughs> in other words, um, uh, having it learn and grow in a way, uh, grow in intelligence in a way that uh, creates a uh, an environment, a positive environment that um, in which human beings are an important part of its learning structure and an important part of meeting its needs, just like with actual human babies. And um, giving it, uh, giving it um, exposure to a wide variety of, of approaches to life, of moral viewpoints, uh, belief systems, uh, ways of doing things, ways of, ways of looking, um, all this sorts of stuff, exposing it to a wide variety of things and, and not necessarily trying to point it too hard in any one direction, but rather um, giving it this broad experience. Again, the sorts of things that in an ideal world, if you had a lot of time, you would do with your own children. Um, and I think that um, that with some refinement could be the foundation of a, of a good way to bring up an AI. The, the tricky part of that approach is you probably only get one shot. <laughs> um, in other words, it, as we discussed very early in this uh, conversation, um, once you have human level AI uh, and it's fully kind of mature in its intellectual capabilities, it can improve itself probably faster than we can stop it. And also, by the way, it can probably outthink us uh, so we can't turn it off. This is the this is the this is why the control problem is nonsensical to me. Um, it's not only dangerous, but it just won't work. Is that they will be it will be able to outsmart us if it truly has human level intelligence that can then be sped up. And so um, uh, we can see we can see that um, uh, uh, by by uh, bringing it up in this way, um, it might work. But once that first one gets there, we can't stop it anymore. So we better hope that we've raised it, raised it well, and that it, and, and that it thinks of us humans as um, as something that are is important to us. Um, just as many humans think that animals are very important to our life uh, as we live it. Hi, David. Um, <clears throat> we're we're running up against the the time here. And I wanted to thank you for all your input, but I wanted to ask one final question um, about what you think the, the overall general um, uh, environment to the coronavirus is going to have on the, the research and the advancement of artificial intelligence. 
Um, well, first, uh, I have to I have to quote um, uh, again Roman Yampolsky, who's a Facebook friend, and he he had a post. He was at, at it was approximately mid March, and he was at a conference about AI safety, and um, he said, "I'm speaking about AI safety." at a conference where the people obviously don't care about a pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I, I suspect that it will change AI research in ways that are pretty similar to the way it's affecting lots of things, meaning it's a, it's a, it's a very big distraction from progress. Um, funding may change, funding structures may change. Um, you know, uh, narrow AI may find some uses in uh, in virology and, and in uh, immunotherapy and yeah and all those sorts of things, um, as it is as it is finding applications in bioscience already. In other words, the deep learning, the application of deep learning to real problems, current problems in bioscience is is that's a big thing. You know, a lot of companies and scientists are trying to do that already. So that sort of thing is going to continue. Um, uh, the progress of AGI has already been largely uh, diverted toward narrow applications. And so um, while I don't see DeepMind changing its direction, I mean, it's hard to know from the outside, but I don't think I have any particular reason to expect them to change their direction. Google seems to be doing well in this environment. Um, uh, not really many other people are working on it, on it uh, at that level. Um, it's the same small catter of, of folks who kind of believe in this approach and, and understand it and understand the biology. Um, uh, you know, Randy O'Reilly, uh, who I've worked with in the past, and some of his other colleagues uh, continue to do simulations of the brain uh, uh, more to find out how brains work than to create artificial intelligence. But of course, finding out how the brains work in in my view, uh, is the way to create artificial intelligence ultimately. So, um, uh, to, to 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 kind of summarize and answer your question about how this affects it, I don't really think all that much because some of the changes that have taken place over the past two or three years have already changed the direction of it uh, quite a bit. Um, and uh, it's very difficult to predict how far we are away from AGI. I don't know if that's a question that interests you, but um, you know, the, there's, there, there are a lot of these surveys done among the experts and they, you know, there's always a bell curve and some of them predict 10 years and a very small number. Um, some of them predict 300 years, also a very small number. And a lot of them are in kind of the 40, 50, 60 year time horizon. So, um, you know, this is something that faces us on approximately the same time scale as, uh, you know, the, some of the impacts of climate change uh, face us um, with actually quite a bit more severe potential consequences. <laughs> well, thank you very much for uh, all your, your thoughts on this uh, extremely complicated topic here. And, uh, um, and I want to thank Trent for um, helping us put all this together. But I, uh, I, I think that you've given us a tremendous amount to think about, and uh, I, I wish you the best as you continue to research this topic. So thank you all for joining us on this, and uh, hope to have you come back again next month. Thank you. My pleasure, Thomas. Thank you. <laughs>